Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Pisa Presents on Fluorescent Minerals. So now that we have our tour guide here with us, why don't we just follow her to the next step. So let's see what we're going to examine today. First we're going to look at what is fluorescence, what is the phenomenon itself, and how is it caused. Also too, we'll examine some regional sites and resources, as well as look at a few fluorescent minerals themselves. In other words, a lot of this is going to be some very pretty pictures. So now, 15% of all minerals actually fluoresce. They do not glow in the dark. Please don't say that. It's one of my big pet peeves. They do not glow in the dark. They fluoresce. Now, how does this happen? Well, in order to find out, we'll look at our friend, the electron. So here's the electron just by itself, chilling, do whatever electrons do on a Friday evening, probably watching Netflix or something. Now, when an electron is like this, it is in its what's called ground state, just doing what it does. But say that something would happen, like some energy would come along. Well, here's some energy just, oh, there it goes. So that energy snaking along, it encounters the electron. Now, under certain circumstances, that electron can then absorb basically some of that energy. Now getting that energy in the electron elevates it to a higher energy level. So it pops up and it enters in what's called an excited state. Now during this process, so basically it just absorbs some of this light and then light of a different wavelength gets released right after because this is a hard thing to do to remain in an excited state for an electron. It can only do it for so long. It pops right up, releases some of that energy, and then once it releases that energy, it then just naturally goes back down to its ground state. Now, this energy itself, this releasing right there, that, well, because of just how the human eye views things, the spectrum of visible light and whatnot, the eye perceives a color change during this. Now, this color change can be very characteristic to the mineral involved. And as was found out by this guy right here with the absolutely awesome sauce to Kenzie and Mutton Chops, George Gabriel Stokes. So in 1852, he was studying this mineral right here, which is, from the audience folks, fluorite. So he was studying fluorite and he noticed that fluorite, well, <laughs> fluoresced. And that is actually where we get the word fluorescence from. It is in honor of the mineral fluorite, which fluoresces kind of like a very nice blue, almost sort of at times a purple color, like that right there. This specimen is from England. So at the top you have visible light. And then down at the bottom, you have the mineral itself actually fluorescing, which is, again, this the way that the human eye perceives this release of energy. Now, fluorescence itself is caused by activators within the mineral or compound. Now, so these are actual compounds, actual components within the mineral itself can cause this. Mineral impurities, things like, say, lead is a common one you'll find, tungsten, a bunch of other ones or even just the usual chemical defects, inclusions, whatnot, something out of the ordinary. Really, an activator can be, well, a lot of different things. And for a very great resource on them, you can visit this site right here. And for those folks that are watching it on YouTube, I'll link it down below. It just shows certain activators under different characteristics and conditions and how one can affect one substance versus another, basically. It's very, very nice comparison and contrast. Now, these reactions that cause fluorescence are caused by many things, but most famously, the thing that triggers it in the beginning is ultraviolet light. Now, there are three main categories of this. You have short wave, mid wave, and long wave. In this region, that's at least that I'm giving this talk in, short wave is abbreviated SW, mid wave MW, and long wave LW. So they have the various wavelengths right there. Long wave has 315 to 400, 315 to 280 is mid, and short is 280 to 100 nanometers. Now, these activated compounds, well, self-activated compounds fluoresce on their own. They can just do it by themselves, like this mineral right here, autonite. 
Now, some minerals can require a coactivator like manganese or calcite to give the electron a boost. It, it just needs a little bit of help sometimes, like all of us do. So now this photo right here is actually calcite, which is the red, franklinite, it's the dark black, and willemite is the bright apple green. Now this is under shortwave. Quencher activators, well, they're not really activators, they actually do the opposite. They lessen fluorescence. A uh, major thing that does this is copper. Now, these specimens are placed near to a portable UV lamp. You've probably seen quite a few of these. Portable lights can be found lamp or even flashlight sized. Now, if you're going to a large show, definitely bring one of these along if you're expecting to look at fluorescent minerals. You can bring a little handheld lamp and also too, sometimes people, if you're really getting serious into it, consider bringing a little like a tent with you almost something kind of like the size of a large dinner plate. It's, I've seen lots of people at Mineral Fest, they'll put these little tents over where these minerals are on a dealer's table, and then they'll be able to put their light in there, and it basically removes the extraneous light, or it helps reduce it. So you get a better grasp of how these minerals fluoresce. Now, some sources on fluorescence in the area of our club. Well, our colleagues of the Rock and Mineral Club of Lower Bucks County, PA, hi guys, they have a regular show called Ultraviolation that specializes on fluorescence. Also, the absolutely wonderful FOMS, NOJMS, and other clubs' local and major sites, one of which we'll get into very soon. And serious, serious thanks that I cannot, I it, they were great. So naturesrainbows.com is the major site for fluorescent mineral images and a lot of different resources and information. And also too, the images that they put up there as a matter of site policy are actually then listed as public domain, which is where I've gotten a lot of the subsequent images are actually from nature's rainbows, the ones that are of the minerals that is. And if you're looking into a very, very great book, I can extremely well recommend. It is a three volume series, The Mineralogy of Franklin in Ogdensburg, New Jersey. And they are very, very good. I believe it's over 1400 pages combined. Or of course, you can just visit us, Pisa at Mineral Fest. Now you can join our Empress of Fluorescence, Lauren. You can kind of see her elbow there in the fluorescent room on the side, and then Kent and others are now taking over our stage with some fluorescent guys, and also any one of our other dealers and other folks. But too, there is a very, very major source for fluorescent minerals and information right in our general area, probably the most major one. So let's go back a couple years to 1.3 billion years exactly, to the wonderful state of New Jersey. So what do we have going on here? Well, a shallow sea is covering today's Sussex County. The sea is located between two tectonic plates. They're a bit, mm, they're angry. So now as he's subducting, the one plate is subducting under the other, and that is causing it to undergo melting. At the same time, the sea floor that is in between them has white, very calcium rich carbonate muds. So metal, specifically zinc, escapes into these carbonate muds through fracture zones in these plates that keep in mind are interacting with each other. Now, eventually a continental plate comes along too as well, which then goes over and slowly buries these deposits. So with time, pressure, temperature, your usual metamorphic things, this substance metamorphoses into the Franklin marble. And then these metal rich fluids that were brought up earlier, then become ore bodies, famously zinc. Now, this is one of the two major sources of just absolute funsies. When you go over there in that region, there is the Franklin mine and oops, sorry. And then we have the Sterling Hill mine as well. Now both museums. So how did these places come about really? And how did they get to be such major centers of fluorescent minerals other than just really being located in the right place at the right time? Well, 
It's actually kind of an odd story, but still all the same, it's a very good lesson to show people just how much science can progress and really not to look backwards on people that may not make what appear to be the best judgments, such as that guy in the corner. That's Lord Sterling, S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G. He's the namesake of Sterling Hill. They just changed it to an E for the one I. So now there are over 350 mineral species we now know at Franklin and Sterling Hill. Roughly 90 of them fluoresce. Over two dozen are only found there with quite a few others, that being their type locality, which is where the, that means that's where the first place they were found. But that's what we know now. That wasn't what people knew in the 1700s. Back then, mineralogy was really in its infancy, and a lot of folks in the area called that entire region by Franklin and Sterling Hill the Copper Tract. Why? Well, they didn't really know that these minerals were fluorescent. They didn't care about that. They just thought that they were copper. Why? Because they were red. Now, while that may seem kind of silly today, again, people didn't know better at the time. We now know today that while there are 38 copper minerals in the area, none are in economically viable quantities, but that didn't stop Lord Sterling. So he saw all this red material and insisting it was cuprite, a copper ore, he shipped a hack ton of it to England and Wales multiple times for smelting. They kept coming back to him just, hey, this, this ain't copper, what are you doing? And then he kept thinking he was being punked or something, so he would send more stuff back and back and forth and back and forth. And this happened for years. And then finally, in the 1770s, he found another mineral, a very dark color mineral. So he thought that that was magnetite, which is actually an iron ore. So what did he do? Well, he actually indirectly then started smelting, modern smelting in the area, thinking that he was going to smelt this iron ore from the magnetite. Sterling then got a bunch of these mines together thinking that he was going to do this smelting, except he was trying to smell the mineral that he couldn't really smelt. And basically, long story short, of course, he was wrong. Now, one of the funny parts of it is that today, these misidentified minerals, they occasionally, very, very rarely, like I see maybe two, three times a year, I'll hear of old labels from very, very old collections in the 17 or 1800s will be labeled, say, cuprite from Sterling Hill, New Jersey, or something along those ends. Yes, it's not cuprite, but all the same, these labels have actually become collector's items as a sort of way to allow people to look back on the history of fluorescent minerals and just how far we've become. And finally, what made us really get things right was a guy in 1810, Dr. Samuel Fowler. He was a local rock hound, and it also helped that he was married to Rebecca Ogden, as of, you know, the Ogden family from the area. So he became the new owner of a lot of the mine land, in part through his wife. So he's looking at this, and he's just, yeah, this really ain't cuprite after all. He tested it and found out it was a new mineral, which was named zincite. And then in 1819, a different individual tested the alleged magnetite, and found out it wasn't, surprise, not magnetite, but it was really an oxide of zinc, manganese, and iron. That species was named Franklinite. It was also a new mineral, and in 1830, the mineral Willamite was discovered in the region. So zincite, Franklinite, and Willamite are the three very, very famous mineral ores from the Franklin area, and it's actually kind of ironic because when you think about how fluorescent these minerals are and how famous Franklin and Sterling Hill are for fluorescent minerals, the namesake mineral Franklinite actually does not fluoresce. So we have two New Jersey mines two and a half miles apart. A lot of these mines back when uh, Sterling and then all these other people started finding these minerals and then back when they knew what they actually were and they knew that they were zinc minerals it started a lot of this zinc mining and other related mines in the region. Now, so we have, you know, our two friends from earlier and the New Jersey Zinc Company, which was in charge of a lot of this land, they kind of caught wise to things pretty quickly that they knew that something unique they had really. 
because a lot of the guys that worked in the mines, the miners would actually have mineral swaps. They would take home entire wheelbarrows full of material, bring them home, and then they would trade minerals in each other's basements, like their own local club, basically. Now, this is a still inside the Sterling Hill mine, a recent one. So, falling zinc prices and competition caused Sterling Hill to close in 1986. But fortunately, in 87, two area brothers bought it up at a tax sale. They were fascinated by minerals, fluorescent minerals, just minerals in general. And they were terrified that something would happen, like the property would be bought, it would be turned over into something else, and basically that the area's geologic history would be lost. So they decided to reopen everything as a museum. And it took a couple of years, but finally in 1990, the Sterling Hill Mining Museum opens with the Thomas S. Warren Museum of Fluorescence in what was the mill back in the day. And then in 1991, the mine itself was added to the National Register of Historic Places. And I was so proud saying that just now. It's, you know, good for them. So the Franklin Mine had already closed under similar circumstances in 1954. In case you're wondering that Franklin was named after Ben Franklin, that may be a myth. Very, very early sources, the earliest that people can find, actually say that the area of Franklin, I believe it was a borough, was named after a early then governor, William Franklin, not Ben Franklin. So that's, you know, that's just an urban legend probably. So in 1957, the Kiwanis Club of Franklin hosted a mineral show as a fundraiser for their group. And this really took on. And then in 1959, the absolutely wonderful people that are the FLNS, the Franklin Ogdensburg Mineralogical Society, you guys rock, no pun intended, they were founded. And then in July 1st, in 1963, the Franklin Mineral Museum opened as well. Now, this is going to lead off some of our, basically our gallery of regional fluorescent minerals. This one here is a Sterling Hill Sphalerite, Willemite, Franklinite, and Talc. So we're going to look at basically the mineral, how it is right there in visible light. So you can see these are, this particular image is in shortwave. If you see an SW, the vast majority of these are in shortwave. Shortwave is a lot easier to get images out of, to get a decent fluorescence. So unless it's noted, these are all in shortwave. So you're looking at that and maybe just focus on an area of the specimen. And then let's just say that I get out a lamp, shall we? Well, here we go. So that shows you how this color change can really go about. So like Roebling Knight, it's named after the family of engineers that built the bridge in New York, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Roebling, George Washington Roebling, I believe was the father. That's the red one. And then you have the blue and the little, little, the tiny green dots in there. That's Willamite. Willamite is very, very famously a bright apple green. So here's calcite, Willamite, and hydrozincite. And again, just try to focus on something and imagine what it turns into. So there, the calcite is red. Calcite usually fluoresces that bright cherry Kool-Aid red. And then the hydrozincite is kind of like the purplish blue. And then we have quite a few specimens right there. This one comes out looking really neat. One second. There we go. Almost like it has lightning on it with the willamite. Now, this is to show you some of the differences between long wave and short wave. So on the bottom, you have visible light, and then we have long wave, and then we have short wave. Same specimen, same mineral. You get three different colors, at least three different how the human eye perceives colors, depending on how you put it out under UV. Now, this is hyalophane right there, and here we go. I just love that color. I love the ones that fluoresce red. I don't know why, I just, I do. Now, Norbergite is another one. Now, this is an assortment of long wave minerals. So this is under LW, this is long wave, which serious props to this guy for getting this many minerals to fluoresce this good under long wave, because they can be very, very finicky. 
like fluorite can example fluorite for example that's one of those minerals that fluorite can fluoresce actually somewhat differently depending on the location so the color of fluorite itself fluorescing isn't really indicative necessarily of where it came from because it's just it it's so prone to different differences and activators and other things in it so say just take a peek at one of these like i'll look at the uh the willamite down below in those little black flecks you can see and the one maybe at the six o'clock portion that's franklinite and willamite the franklinite are the black specks and then there you go again right there so here is one of the rare minerals in franklin which when you're a rare mineral in franklin that says a heck of a lot but still all the same it's absolutely lovely and it almost goes like this lilac color now this is a really really big one that I liked a lot too as well. It was so hard picking just a few of these just to show back and forth so definitely go on this nature's rainbow site. It was absolutely wonderful and to close for today I absolutely wanted to end with this one. It's Willamite Lightning in a Hardy Stenight Sky is the title. So here we go folks under shortwave and there it is. That is absolutely wonderful and just think that's all within the mineral itself. That is just how it reacts naturally under UV light and how we see it. And really the physics of it are something absolutely marvelous to study and behold. So thank you very much folks. I very, very just absolutely cannot any more highly recommend going to Franklin and Sterling Hill. They are both open for visitors. They are run by some absolutely lovely people. Please check out some of our sister clubs in the area. Visit Ultraviolation if you can get over there. And above all, just head on out and enjoy some rocks. Thank you now.